Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. I'm going to talk about a young man called Ross Albright on the show today. Now, Ross Albright was the creator and maintainer of an online marketplace called The Silk Road. And the name The Silk Road alludes to the old uh, commerce path that connected the Orient to Europe uh, back in the day. And this marketplace was very unlike most of the online marketplaces. It wasn't like eBay or Amazon in the sense that it sold goods that any other organization can sell. Uh, it was selling illegal goods, things that the government considered to be banned. And uh, there were drugs, there were weapons, there were prostitution, there were all sorts of things that you would not be able to buy on the open market that were being transferred from one person to another using the Silk Road online marketplace. And uh, Ross Albright was arrested, and he's facing a lifetime in prison for um, running this online marketplace, not even selling and trading and actually buying the uh, goods that are available on his marketplace, but rather because he was creating the environment where people could buy and sell and trade, he was the one that was pinned with all of the charges being brought up against the Silk Road online marketplace. So, a little while ago, I did a show on the famous lawbreakers in history, and on that show, I highlighted people like Harriet Tubman, uh, Rosa Parks, and Anne Frank of Germany, and I showed how they broke the law. These were people who we admire and revere as uh, people who stood up against unfair and things that were unjust in their society. And yet we have to acknowledge that what they were standing up against really was government laws that were invalid and were violations of the non-aggression principle. And here we have a very similar situation where you have a young man, Ross Albright, who is just enabling people to engage in what would otherwise be known as voluntary transactions which harm no one because they are just economic exchanges. Now, of course, the government does not want these goods and services being traded openly on the market, but that does not mean that the people who are trading these goods are initiating force against other people. So if I trade somebody a weapon, um, that weapon could potentially be used for violent means and would thereby contradict the non-aggression principle. But the actual transaction between two people where they both voluntarily agree to the terms of the exchange is no violation whatsoever of the non-aggression principle. So in this case where there is a marketplace where the government is attacking people for trading things that they're not supposed to trade, the actual aggressor and the initiator of violence in this situation is the government themselves. And so there's been a lot of controversy in the libertarian circles concerning Ross Albright and whether he is regarded in the same ranks as Harriet Tubman and Anne Frank and Rosa Parks, the people who stood up to unjust laws, or whether he was acting kind of self-destructively and uh, you know, knowing that the government was going to come after him and put him in a jail for probably the rest of his life. And so the first article I'd like to read is in favor of the idea that he was a heroic lawbreaker. And uh, this article was posted on studentsforliberty.org, and it was posted by Jason Bias. Ross Albright and the Courage to Break the Law On May 29th, Ross Albright was given a life sentence. His lawyers say they will try to appeal. The charges for which Albright will likely spend his life in prison all center around the Silk Road marketplace, which allowed users to peacefully trade illegal drugs over the internet. Though he admitted to originally creating the site, Albright has maintained that he quickly handed it off to others. Rather than dwelling on the details of the case, though, I want to focus on something else. Ross Albright is a hero, worthy of our praise, whose virtues we ought to cultivate in ourselves. He deserves our respect for his courage to break the law. Albright not only saw a way that he could make the world a better and more just place, he saw a way to do it without first getting the law to agree. 
Most importantly, he acted on the information he had. By establishing the Silk Road, Albright undoubtedly saved countless lives. With the Silk Road, buyers and sellers of drugs could trade in peace, without having to deal with the art artificially dangerous offline drug market. The site's system of reviews and ratings further allowed buyers to alert others of bad products, ensuring that people got what they paid for. All this was possible because Albright not only had entrepreneurial alertness, but also the courage to risk imprisonment. He did not waste time with ballot initiatives, campaigns, or lobbying. He went straight to the source, taking direct action by circumventing the law. Yet this special courage is also why he has been so demonized. The prosecution insisted on a life sentence, apparently believing that the 20-year mandatory minimum was just not enough. The judge agreed, saying, quote, Silk Road's birth and present presence asserted that its creator was better than the laws of this country. This is deeply troubling, terribly misguided, and very dangerous. Albright's actions made a mockery of the state's power, along with the standard procedures for questioning that power, and so willful dis disobedience cannot be tolerated. At the same time, Albright was being hunted, captured, and prosecuted for the crime of helping people peacefully sell drugs online. The movement to legalize marijuana was starting to see some of its most substantial victories. The law was finally starting to grant some, albeit very limited, experimentation with not ruining people's lives for owning plants. This experimentation had to be on the state's terms, however, including the expected regulatory swamp and the expected rent-seeking predators who know exactly how to swim in that swamp. For Albright to run an experiment of his own, trying laissez-faire instead of monopoly, was totally unacceptable to the state. If history is any example, Albright may leave a legacy that does him justice. After all, even those who support his treatment are willing to acknowledge his virtue when it's found in history. We see this in the recent push to put Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. Few, if any, are still willing to publicly deny that Tubman was not only a hero, but a hero because of her courage to break the law. She saw a way to free multitudes of people treated like cattle, and she refused to wait until white America's laws agreed that slavery was evil before she did it. Now that the laws agree, she is universally revered. Sometimes this transformation from condemnation to commendation can be quick. In his second inaugural address, Barack Obama briefly honored those who fought for justice at Stonewall. This is somewhat startling, given that the events he referred to were riots in which gay and transgender women and, and men flatly refused to comply with police orders. They did not submit to the written law, but instead demanded it either respect their existence or expect their resistance. They not only had the courage to break the law, but to physically defend themselves against those who tried to enforce it. Now, because even the law acknowledges how inhumane it is to arrest someone for wearing insufficiently heteronormative clothing, these heroes receive praise in a president's inaugural address. What is so often clear in retrospect, though muddled in the present, is a crucial distinction between two types of law, artificial and natural. The former is morally r irrelevant and state-made, consisting of written words brought about by the state's preferred procedures, which will reliably be enforced by state agents. The latter springs out of morality itself, consisting of the rights and obligations we are already required to respect. The only thing that would ever slow us down is prudence, whether or not you'll get caught. Sometimes, though, the good is so great that risks must be taken. We should honor those, like Ross Albright, Chelsea Manning, and Edward Snowden, who had the courage to seek justice in spite of what the criminal justice system might do to them. Hosting file-sharing sites that slowly make copyright unenforceable, protecting undocumented immigrants from deportation, dodging the draft or deserting the military, and countless other violations of artificial law are truly heroic.
juries themselves are refusing to enforce laws and instead using jury nullification to make those laws invalid and unenforceable. That article is by Jason Bias, and it was posted at studentsforliberty.org. It was called Ross Albright and the Courage to Break the Law. The next article I would like to read is uh, arguing the opposite of this, uh, saying that Ross, Ross Albright is not a hero. And uh, this article is by Jeff Deist at Mises.org. You can read it online at Mises.org. Is Ross Albright a libertarian hero? Last Friday came the unpleasant news that Ross Albright, the 31-year-old former operator of the Silk Road site, has been sentenced by a federal court to life in prison without parole. This follows his conviction in February for typically dubious, i.e. nowhere in the Constitution, federal crimes including conspiracy, money laundering, and the circular engaging in a continuing criminal enterprise. His sentence, which appears unduly sadistic even by today's standards, was handed down with a lecture from Judge Catherine B. Forrest. Quote, what is clear is that you were the captain of the ship as Dread Pirate Roberts, and you made your own law. It was your opus, and you wanted it to be your legacy. What you did was unprecedented, she told Albright, and in breaking that ground as the first person, he had to be punished accordingly. You are no better person than any other drug dealer. Too bad he wasn't sentenced like any other drug dealer. The central issue in the Albright case, as always, is an evil and unbridled federal government. No human being should be locked away for engaging in or facilitating peaceful, voluntary commerce among willing participants. Dark sites like the Silk Road and the cyber payment systems they employ exist because of state prohibitions on voluntary human conduct. They are natural market reactions to government interference. This cannot be overstated. But is Albright a commendable libertarian martyr by definition simply by virtue of falling into the crosshairs of an immoral federal government waging an unjust drug war? Does lamenting his indefensible sentence mean celebrating him and his actions? The libertarian blogosphere seems to think so. Social media buzzed all weekend with praise for Albright as a brave soul who created a safer alternative to buying drugs off the street. For many libertarians, he is worthy of praise for taking agorism to the next level via technology, for challenging the state head-on and paying the price. Albright himself is no longer so sure. He exhibits deep regret, not only for throwing his young life away, but also for dragging his family through hell and he apparently no longer shares the same view of maximum freedom that his libertarian champions hold. Quote, Silk Road was supposed to be about giving people the freedom to make their own choices, to pursue their own happiness, he said. I learned from Silk Road that when you give people freedom, you don't know what they'll do with it. Who can blame him for changing his tune in the end, whether to curry favor with the judge or not? After all, it won't be his Facebook fans spending the next five or six decades in a supermax federal cell. Furthermore, there are allegations by federal prosecutors that Albright sought to have several people killed for threatening to disrupt the operation of Silk Road. Now, of course, we must rush to Albright's defense here. Prosecutors are notorious liars, and undoubtedly they floated the solicitation of murder charge both to discredit him publicly and to deny him bail pending trial. Furthermore, even the most specious allegations often scare the daylights out of suspects and thus help secure plea agreements. So we shouldn't put much faith into this, especially since the solicitation charges were not merely dropped by prosecutors. They were never brought at all, despite the sentencing judge's contention that Albright's unambiguous journal entries prove he paid hitmen. His mother thinks the entries are bogus. It's tempting to dismiss the simplistic power of the state's narrative about Albright. But hitmen aside, do libertarians really want to create cause celebre out of a young man who used his intelligence and talents to sell drugs online, even without thoroughly understanding his background and his personality? 
Agorism and its implications, however much they resonate with libertarians, have always been a losing proposition with the general public. The public might rally behind a medical doctor who supplies marijuana illegally to help a sick cancer patient, or an individual suffering with MS who uses a foreign online pharmacy to obtain prescription drugs not approved by the FDA. But trafficking in illicit drugs, drugs used recreationally or by addicts rather than medical patients, is something different altogether. And while attitudes toward marijuana have changed considerably, organs like the DEA remain effective at portraying traffickers as ruthless and sinister criminals. Unfortunately, the Silk Road prosecution will only strengthen dark connections in the public hive mind between internet markets, privacy, cryptocurrencies, and real, i.e. not victimless, criminality. That these connections are mostly unfounded misses the point. The conflation of voluntarist agorism with libertarianism is not likely to push the public in our direction. Albright is reputed to have read Rothbard, but Rothbard wrote the definitive contra-agorism article way back in 1980, when online markets existed only in sci-fi novels. Engaging in a friendly joust with agorist figurehead Samuel Konkin, Rothbard demonstrated a decidedly negative view of agorism's value to the libertarian movement. Quote, It is no accident that the entire spectrum of the black market movement, from tax rebels to agoric theoreticians, are almost exclusively self-employed. Black marketeers might well benefit themselves in the micro sense, but they have no relevance to the macro struggle for liberty and against the state. Indeed, in a kind of reverse invisible hand, they might even be counterproductive. It is possible that the Soviet black market, for example, is so productive that it keeps the entire monstrous Soviet regime afloat, and that without it, the Soviet system would collapse. This does not mean, of course, that I scorn or oppose black market activities in Russia. It is just to reveal some of the unpleasant features of the real world. Much as I love the market, I refuse to believe that when I engage in a regular market transaction, e.g. buying a sandwich, or a black market activity, e.g. driving at 60 miles per hour, I advance one iota nearer the libertarian revolution. The black market is not going to be the path to liberty, and libertarian theoreticians and activists have no function in that market. In other words, black market entrepreneurs, like all entrepreneurs, will sink or swim without the assistance of libertar libertarian theorists. Clearly, Mr. Albright is the victim of shocking injustice, but his story serves as a cautionary tale about the priorities of those who seek a freer society. We should celebrate men and women of good character who wake up every day and provide us with value, whether economic, familial, so societal, civil, or religious. These are true libertarian heroes, individuals who go around, under, over, or through the state and its clutches in their everyday lives. It is not always the swashbuckling anti-hero, but often the quiet, sober, staid, bourgeois businessman who deserves praise for sustaining us. That article was by Jeff Deist. It is called, Is Ross Albright a Libertarian Hero? And it was posted on Mises.org. So the final article I would like to read on the show this morning is kind of a synopsis or an analysis of these two opposing viewpoints. To break the law or not to break the law, that is the question. And we don't really have a good answer for that because, um, you know, we look back in time and these people who are famous now for breaking the law, such as Harriet Tubman, who opposed the law and illegally acted and are now revered as heroes, uh, that might not be the case in the present moment and we might be throwing our lives away by opposing the state in direct action of illegally doing things that the state does not uh, want us to do. And so Bionic Mosquito is going to talk about this in his article, We Can Be Heroes. And this uh, was posted on bionicmosquito.blogspot.com. This is a difficult post to write. 
first and most important, a young man's life has been stripped from him for a non-violent offense, a crime that is no crime. Additionally, it is difficult because, in the end, I have no satisfying answer to the question, is Ross Albright a libertarian hero? I posted a couple of comments at the Mises.org site in response to Jeff Diaz's posts. I offer my primary comment here. Quote, no matter how much we might disagree, the state will not tolerate anonymous financial transactions except cash and only barely. Those who promoted the anonymity value of Bitcoin and various anonymous marketplaces as advances toward freedom did no one a service. There are ways to advance the libertarian cause in addition to those mentioned by the author in the last paragraph, ways that, in addition, come with the benefit of not painting a bullseye on your chest. Raise your children well. Take every rule the state allows and stretch it. Two of the most radical statements for freedom are perfectly legal and relatively easy in the United States, homeschooling and firearms ownership. Both offer opportunities to extend the franchise to the next generation. There is no advancement of freedom without successes in education. In general, we get all the state that the public demands. Count how many people opt out at the airport line as one example. Watch how many people stand and cheer at the military worship at a sports event as another. I would like to expand on my thoughts in this post. I will let you know now, I am not going to offer a satisfying answer to the question, is Albright a libertarian hero? I find it almost unanswerable. Hero. 1. A man of distinguished courage or ability, admired for his brave deeds and noble qualities. 2. A person who, in the opinion of others, has heroic qualities or has performed a heroic act and is regarded as a model or ideal. Virtually every word in the definition is subjective, at least in my view. How do you solve for a problem with so many variables? Per the di dictionary definition, a hero is in the eyes of the beholder. That doesn't help much. What is a libertarian hero? One view considers the fight as one of ideas. Therefore, the libertarian hero is the great writer, thinker, philosopher, debater. It doesn't take much to come up with several names that would fit. Murray Rothbard is certainly on the list, and first on the list. Further, it seems to me one could c include a non-libertarian like Ayn Rand, as many libertarians point to her writing as foundational, or at least inspirational, in their journey. There is also a view of the libertarian hero as a person of action, taking the ideas of freedom and giving these life. A dealer in precious metals could be considered as such. It is in this group that the dialogue regarding Albright belongs. Within this group, there are two subsets, taking action within the law and taking action outside of the law. I offered a couple of examples of taking action within the law in my comment cited above, homeschooling and firearms ownership. Both actions are quite legal in the United States. Both actions offer a means to express and expand liberty. Deist offers, in his concluding paragraph, other possibilities even less demonstrative than my suggestions, examples of everyday heroes, equally valid. Then there is taking action outside of the law, and again this is where the dialogue surrounding Albright is to be found. There are many examples of this type even in the last several years. Edward Snowden, Adam Kokesh, Randy Weaver, David Koresh, Andrew Stack, and Timothy McVeigh, and Erwin Schiff, all, rightly or wrongly, conjure up images of this type. And if I can include Ayn Rand as a libertarian hero on the thinker side, I can certainly include in this group those who did not necessarily make clear libertarian arguments for their actions. Even this group can be divided into violent versus nonviolent, and I find no reason to celebrate those in the violent camp. In any case, Albright falls into the nonviolent camp, the camp where libertarians and others would suggest that there is no crime. One could look further afield, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, they broke laws, yet each would be considered a hero within their sphere. What separates this group from the Kokeshes, Schiffs, and now Albrights of the world may be nothing more than time and a following. Parks, King, and Gandhi each worked within a movement that had legs, continuity.
They may have been at the source of the river, or one of the first tributaries, but they are considered by many to be heroes, only because they inspired followers to take action. Only because of those followers, or the evidence of beneficial fruits of, the, of their actions, are they remembered as heroes. After each, a movement grew. After each, a significant change took place. Maybe not an appropriate hurdle to determine hero status, but if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears, well, you know. I will add one other thought on the subject of hero. It seems to me that a hero suffers his consequences. He does not back away from the principle that drove him to act. Albright has backed away, however. Quote, I believed at the time that people should have the right to buy and sell whatever they wanted so long as they weren't hurting anyone else. However, I've learned since then that taking immediate action on one's beliefs without taking the necessary time to really think them through can have disastrous consequences. Silk Road turned out to be a very naive and costly idea that I deeply regret. Here I come to a difficult bridge for me personally. To properly assess the question of hero, I feel I must assess this statement. Yet this leads me to seem critical of someone whose life is unjustifiably ruined. Albright's statement is not a statement of one who thought through his principles and actions, understood the potential consequences, and chose to act in the face of this. It is not the statement of one with firm conviction in his previously assumed principled beliefs. The statement does not lend itself to a hero. Snowden never made such a statement. Then again, Snowden's punishment is not life in prison without parole. Gandhi never made such a statement. To my knowledge, Erwin Schiff never made such a statement, and Schiff is spending more than a decade in prison with time still to go, at his age, a life sentence. Is Albright a libertarian hero? Until I examined this statement, I felt this was impossible for me to answer. Now, I guess if forced to answer the question based on this construct, my answer would be no. However, I don't like the answer, because I don't like that a young man's life is ruined for a non-crime. I don't like writing it, and I don't like that people close to him might read it. And I am not even sure if I fully believe it. In the end, I go back to the subjective nature of the definition, and that sub subjectivity allowing for reasonable people to come to different conclusions. I also consider the as-yet-to-be-determined future that may result due to Albright's actions, and conclude, as I began, with no satisfying answer. That article is by the Bi Bionic Mosquito, and you can read it at bionicmosquito.blogspot.com. It's called We Can Be Heroes. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Austrian Circle. Is Ross Albright a hero? Uh, is he a hero for breaking the law? I guess only time will really tell, because that's what we know about the great heroes who did break the law. Uh, Harriet Tubman at the time was not especially revered as a hero, but later in the history and the passage of time revealed her as the hero that she was. And so I guess we're just going to have to wait this out, but I hope that you enjoyed this uh, conversation, the two sides of whether he was a hero or whether he was not a hero. And I hope that you'll tune in next week for another episode of the Austrian Circle. Have a great week. Take care. <laughs>